Uh, now I'd like to introduce Khalife from, uh, he's a C uh, data science manager at uh, Home Depot. He was, uh, when we chatted, he yeah. was uh, a, a managing a data science team at Career Builder. So he, I think he's going to talk about his work at Career Builder and semantic search. Um, so Thank give you. him a round of applause. Yeah, thanks for having me. Right. Do I have the clicker, by the way? The clicker. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Otherwise, OK, there we go. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for having me. My name is Khalif El Jada. I'm the senior manager of data science over the recommendations team at Home Depot. And as uh, uh, he said, actually, I joined Home Depot just six weeks ago. So uh, before that, I was leading the search data science team at Career Builder, where I was lucky enough to actually be involved in the journey of moving from keyword-based search all the way to a semantic search that is now in production for B2B solution. So my talk is actually a real journey that we took from keyword-based search all the way to semantic search. And it is very applicable. All the things that I describe are actually now in production. So it is not something that we put in research papers and we didn't put in production. And on the other hand, all the work that I'm going to talk about today is actually published. So you will find research paper about each component or segment of the semantic search engine that we built. I believe we published about six to seven research papers out of this work. And they all, you can find them on my website. So let me see if that's work. Yep. So as I said, I'm now uh, the, uh, besides my work at Home Depot, I'm also a senior research scientist at the Legal Analytics Lab at Georgia State University. And um, I hold PhD in computer science from University of Georgia. I'm the founder of the Southern Data Science Conference, which is a community initiative to bring a uh, no sales pitches conference to the Southeast region. So uh, it's all about uh, knowledge sharing. And also I co-founded athletics.org, which is a nonprofit organization that uh, tend to use the power of data science and data analytics for community services. Athletics refer to Atlanta Analytics for Community Service. And it is a nonprofit organization. We work on homeless problem. We work on a traffic problem, different data sets that we get from uh, different organizations. And we try to use the community to work on those problems. All right. So when we talk about search and recommendation, we're talking about information retrieval systems. So how many people here are actually at school studied information retrieval? Mm -hmm. Many of you, right? But how many people studied databases, relational databases? You will see most of the room, right? So information retrieval are not that popular like relational databases, but they are very uh, popular in our day-to-day -day life. Like when you go to Google, you are, you are basically using information retrieval system. When you use Netflix, as my colleagues presented before, uh, the recommendation engine, it is information retrieval system. So those are examples of information retrieval systems. So let's start with the definition of what is information retrieval. It is finding material, usually unstructured documents, of an unstructured nature, usually text, that satisfies an information need from within large collections. So if you take this, I highlighted some keywords here, finding, which means you are now conducting actually a search task. And unstructured, because we're not working now with rows and columns like relational database, satisfies need is this is the goal of the information retrieval system. If it is a good information retrieval system, it should satisfy the information need. When you go to Google and you type, for example, San Francisco airport, and it comes back to you with results about San Diego airport, that's bad. That's not a good re uh, information retrieval system because it didn't satisfy your information need. You asked for San Francisco airport, it should come back to you with information about San Francisco airport, and so on. So, and by the way, this uh, book mentioned at the bottom is actually free. You can download it for free, and it is an amazing information retrieval book from Stanford website. All right. So let's start with uh, the keyword based search. So how many of you have heard of Apache Solar and Elasticsearch? Cool. So when you get Apache Solar, or if you get Elasticsearch, out of the box, what I'm describing in this slide is what you get. So 
Traditional keyword-based search work this way. You type on the search query, on the uh, query box, machine learning. What it does then, it tokenizes this phrase into machine learning, and then it does some NLP task like stimming, so it become, bring things to its root, so it becomes machine learn, and then it adds Boolean operator on top of that, so it becomes machine and learn, and then it sends this phrase now into your index, where all the documents now are indexed. What happened then, as from the search engine perspective, it tries to match any string that has, or any document that has the string machine, and any document that has the string learn, it's gonna be part of the results. Then it's gonna score higher the ones that has both terms, machine and learn, because this is the Boolean operator, right? So this is how it works. Goes to any, go to all the documents. If there is any document contains the string machine and the string learn, then it is a match, return it with the results, okay? What is the problem here? Is that sufficient? Is that good enough? Let's take this example. Assume now in one of the documents, there is a machinist who learned something, and it is mentioned, uh, because I came from recruitment domain, let's talk about resumes. Someone put in his resume that a machinist who learned something. Based on the stimming, machinist and learn, you know, it's gonna match the machine and learn. So that machinist who learned something is gonna come back as part of the results when you search for machine learning. And this is definitely a problem, because if you think of job seeker or recruiter looking for machine, someone with a machine learning background, and I show him someone who's a machinist who learns something, then they will definitely get upset, and they will turn away, they will never come back, right, to use our service. And same thing with software architect. If you take the software and architect, then the building architect will come back as part of the results, you know? So, in conclusion, the Keyword-based search is not the best that we can do. We definitely can go beyond that. So, semantic search actually is the way we define it. We wanna search for things, not strings. Because the keyword-based search, as I described, it basically takes the string and does just the string matching in the document without understanding anything about the phrase that you're looking for. So we need a way then to identify and search for meaning of keyword phrases, not just individual text tokens, which comes, as I said, out of the box from Solar or from Elasticsearch. So when we started this journey, this project, we started with a target. We said, let's see how far we should go. So assume that we have this user's query. Machine learning, research and development, Portland, Oregon software engineer and Hadoop, comma Java. Don't think this is a crazy query. This is actually something normal. We see a lot when we analyze the search logs. So people put such crazy queries in the search box and they want the search engine to answer their questions. So take this query now. In the traditional query parsing, as we described, tokenize, then put the and Boolean operator. So it's look like this after we parse it using the traditional search engine. It looks like machine and learning and research and development and Portland. Now the or, which is Oregon now, it take it as a Boolean operator. So it understand that it is or software and engineer and Hadoop and Java. This is how the traditional search engine can understand your query. We said this is definitely one star search engine. If you wanna take it to the next level, we want semantic query parsing. And in the semantic query parsing, we want the engine to understand that machine learning actually is a thing by itself, and research and development is a thing by itself, it's an entity, and then Portland, Oregon refers to a thing, it's an entity by itself, and then software engineer, Hadoop, Java, each one of them is actually an entity by itself. So we said if we reach this point, if we at least can semantically parse the query and understand the phrases mentioned in the query, then this is what we call a three-star search engine or parsing. Then the next step is, can we go beyond that now? And if I recognize that machine learning is a phrase or is, is an entity, can I then enrich that machine learning with semantically related terms by saying machine learning actually is also related to data scientists, data mining, and artificial intelligence. So then I put in parentheses 
if the document has machine learning, or data scientist, or data mining, or artificial intelligence, then it should be part of the results. Okay? So enriching the entities that we extract out of the query is the four stars engine. Then the five stars engine is if we can recognize from the query that, for example, senior Hadoop developer at Google, senior is a job level, Hadoop developer is a job title, Google is a company. So if we can classify the entities mentioned in the query into their entity types, then in this case we call this five-star engine. So the five-star engine is supposed to recognize the entities, supposed to enrich the entities, and supposed to recognize the types of the entities. If we reach this goal, then we call it a five-star search engine. So this is overall the intent engine, we call it, that we built at Career Builder, and we put in production, as I said, for the B2B. So if you look at the components, we start definitely from the search box. The user type a query. We, while the user is typing a, a query, we have type ahead prediction, where we try to semantically give you autocomplete. So if you start typing JA, then we give you skill Java, job title Java developer, to help you actually choose or autocomplete, but with semantic uh, autocomplete. So it will kind of recognize that there is a skill called Java, there is a job title called Java developer. So while you're typing, you can choose if you want to now choose the skill or the job title. Then we have also the semantic query parsing, which I said it's, it's supposed to recognize actually the entities in the query, either if they are bigram, unigram, trigram, whatever. And then we have the entity type recognition, which takes an entity and classify it into one of the types, either job title, skill, school, company, all those classes. And then we have the query augmentation engine, which takes the entity, enrich it with semantically related entities. And our search engine is solar behind the scene. So we also close the feedback loop. So we take then the feedback from the user. If, for example, we showed autocomplete and he didn't choose any of them, and he typed something totally different, we take that and we feed it again into the engine to improve our prediction. So let's start with how we started by building the semantic related uh, or the semantic knowledge base, which basically stored that machine learning is related to data mining, it's related to data science, it's related to all those things. Okay? At that point when, when we started, we had two options, either build an ontology manually, you know, by hiring lots of people to start like collecting those terms and put them in an ontology, say this related to that, this is like that, all that kind of things. Or we should take the route of trying to detect those relationships automatically. So we took the route of let's detect them automatically first, and then we put them in a, in a semantic knowledge base, which at the end is going to turn to be our ontology. So how can we detect if things are semantically related to each other? In this work, we actually went to the search logs. And search logs actually are a huge source of semantic knowledge. Here's what happened. In the job or the recruitment domain, when a user sits next to the computer and they start a session, and they start typing, looking for a job, they tend to always search for related things in the same session. So, and as I think if you take that even to um, the retail or home improvement now at Home Depot, it's the same thing. When someone is looking for something, at the same session, they tend to change their, their query around that thing. So in this case, I put two examples. Someone looking for Java developer position. So they type Java developer, they see the results. Then they type Java after that to see different results. And then they type J2EE to see different results. This is how the users tend to act when we analyze the search logs. And then another user searching for registered nurse, and then they change to RN, and they change to LPN again from the search logs when we analyzed I think at that time we analyzed 1.5 billion search logs. We figure out that there is a strong semantic relationship that we can detect from the searches conducted by the same user at the same session. So how, how did we represent this data or this knowledge in a way that can enable us to score the relationship between um, Java developer, Java, J2E, and so on? At that time, we built this model in-house, which is 
PGMHD, probabilistic graphical model for massive hierarchical data. And at the first layer, we have the classes of the users, the classification, their categories. So each user in our system, based on their resume, we classify them into one of, uh, of about, I think, 4,000 groups that we have in our taxonomy for job titles. So each title here represents a group of users. Then on the second layer, we put all the terms, the search terms that the users submit in our system. And the edges between the first layer and the second layer represent, in this case, how many people from this class search for that term. So by putting all this data together in one graph, what we can do now is a lot. One thing we did is take now any two nodes on the second layer that has, they have shared parents, and then run this simple base calculation. So give me the probability that Java and J2EE are relevant, given that they share the parent Java developer class. Okay? So you calculate the similarity or the, the probability that two terms are relevant, given the shared parents between both of them. And then the score that you come but that's the score that you calculate at the end actually represent how strong is the relationship between those two terms. So, by doing this, by using the PGMHD and the search logs, what we extracted in this case is for each term or for each entity, a list of semantically related entities. This is step one. Let's move now to step two. All right, so in the search box now, when the user types something, how can we predict or parse the entities within the query? How can we recognize that senior Java developer Hadoop should be parsed as senior Java developer as one thing, and then Hadoop is another thing? How can we recognize that? So what we did in this case is this probabilistic query parser is something that we in the process before I left CB to open source. I think now it is, it got the approval to be open source when I left, so it should be actually uh, soonish uh, on the GitHub of Career Builder where you can actually get the code, the implementation of it. So what we did here, we built language model. That language model is we took about 80 million job postings that we have and we indexed them in, our, in, a, in a special index in Solar as unigram, then as bigram, then as trigram, and then as foregrams. So why we did that? When you, when you index your documents as unigram, bigram, trigram, foregram was the limit we found actually usually any decent or accepted phrase usually doesn't exceed four gram, okay? So when we did that, what we do with the probabilistic uh, query parser is we calculate now the probability of seeing senior as a unigram by itself across all the um, million documents that we indexed. Then we take the probability of senior Java as bigram, then we take the probability of senior Java developer and the probability of senior Java developer Hadoop. And then if we found that there is, um, the probability exceeds a specific threshold that we defined, then we know this is an accepted parsing, and then we choose the longest one. So if there is a trigram accepted as a phrase, which shows the trigram, if bigram is the, is the longest one that passed the threshold, then it is bigram, and so on. So with this implementation, we were able then to say, senior Java developer should be parsed as an entity, and then Hadoop should be parsed as a separate entity. Okay? So this is how we tackle the problem of recognizing entities within the query. Then we came to the problem, okay, I recognize the, the entity. How can I recognize or classify the entity into its type? And in this case, we were interested actually in five classes. Job title, skill, company, school, location. So we have five categories that we care about. I want to know if this entity is actually a job title or a skill or a school or company or a location. So, if you go to the literature uh, that work, the work that uh, people did on type, entity type recognition, you will figure out that most of the time, they tend to do that on 
a context that is usually textual documents, okay, on the document level. So you feed a document, and then if they try to recognize it from within the document, person, organization, location, right? But we are now talking about the query. And when you talk about a query, it is not a document. There is not much context, right? So if you think of the query, the problem that we face now is understanding the types and search queries, like those are the classes. Search queries are short, contextless. And the idea when you do the entity type recognition in, in the text or textual documents, you have, you have enough context, actually, to give you signals if this thing is a person, organization, or so ever. But with a query, no. You have a few keywords, and you need to detect from those a few keywords if this thing is one of five types. Also, some entities have multiple surface forms. Think of University of North Carolina, at Charlotte, UNC, Charlotte, UNCC. They all now are synonyms or surface forms for the same thing, right? That's another problem. And the third problem is the domain-specific jargon. So do you know what is D-O-N? So it appears a lot in our search box. And then when we investigate it, turns out it's the director of nurse, for example. And R-N, registered nurse. So when you have such jargon, usually the pre-built or uh, the systems that mentioned in the literatures won't work for you. They will work for person, for location, for organization, but not for those things. All right. So again, we first of all studied what people have done so far, and it turned out that most of the work around entity type recognition utilize Wikipedia. So everyone described their work. It's always utilizing Wikipedia in a way or another. So some people actually take the title and first paragraph of Wikipedia. Some people take the title and categories of Wikipedia. So they take the entity, hit Wikipedia. If there is a page, they extract the title and the first paragraph. And then they run class train classifier using those. They take the title and the categories, and they build a classifier using those. They take the info box of that Wikipedia page, and they train a classifier using those. And definitely, as you know now, there is DBpedia and Freebase kind of uh, semantic based. So limitations, why we cannot do that? Take Java developer and go to Wikipedia. Is there a page for Java developer in Wikipedia? There's no page, right? So if we want to always use the techniques that hit Wikipedia, take the page that talks about that entity and classify based on that page, the content of that page, it doesn't work like that. Because Java developer doesn't have a page on Wikipedia. So if I want to now take Java developer, hit Wikipedia, no page, what should I classify Java developer then? So I cannot just rely on if there is a page on Wikipedia or not. And again, skill is not one of the categories. So another way to go around this is, OK, look at the categories on Wikipedia. Skill is not a category in Wikipedia. A third problem is the domain-specific jargon, as I said. So our methodology is the following. We enrich the entity that we recognize from the search query from Wikipedia, but in this case, we don't go to Wikipedia and find a page. We go to Wikipedia and we find where this entity was mentioned in the text. So if it was mentioned anywhere in the text in Wikipedia, we then grab the surrounding words around that entity. N window before, N window after, and we take those as the context now. Then we also utilize the job postings because they represent our jargon or our domain knowledge. So we also utilize the, job, the text from job postings to collect another kind of signals or context for the entity. And then we use DBpedia, and we're going to talk about the feature we use from DBpedia, and we use also WordNet. So this is, we built two models. One of them is offline, that runs in a batch processing mode and one of them is online. So for the offline system that we built, what we did, as I said, is we hit Wikipedia, and if we find the entity mentioned anywhere in the Wikipedia, then we take the title of that page, we take the length, we take some text, and the categories of that page where that entity was mentioned. Then we train the word to vic model using 100 million job postings to get the representation of the entities from within our domain. And then we train using those signals an SVM classifier 
where if I give it an, those features for each entity, the word to vec, vec uh, synonyms, synset, and the Wikipedia features, it should predict which class this entity belonged to. When we did that, we couldn't, the, the, let me just skip for a minute. So the time that it takes to classify or to recognize the entity type was about 400 milliseconds. And if you think now on the search query, I cannot get, let the customer wait for 400 milliseconds before I come back with the results, right? So it needs to be definitely way shorter than this. So 400 milliseconds is too much. So for the offline architecture, which, is, which you can see here, there was a bottleneck, and that bottleneck was actually the Wartovic synset, extracting the synonyms from the Wartovic synset for an entity. That was the bottleneck that takes most of the time. So the 400 millisecond was mainly because every time we send an entity to the uh, Wartovic to get the synset, it takes way long time before it comes back. So that's why we said, okay, this is appropriate for offline, which means we train it offline, we get all the entities that, that we extracted from our search logs, we classify them offline, we put them in knowledge base, cool. But how about if something now come into the, within the search box that I never seen before in the search logs? What I'm gonna do? How can I classify it in, in real time? That's why we went and we built the online system. And for the online system, it's the same features, but what we did is we put the Wikipedia into a solar index, that's the first thing. So we indexed Wikipedia into solar, in a solar index. So it becomes uh, like we can query about, we can send a query and, and, and get an answer in real time. Then for the synset, we took, as I said, 100 million job postings, run word to Vic, but this time we indexed in solar as well, each entity and all the synset vector that comes from word to Vic, we put it in solar as well. That was the way we kind of went around the time that the Wartovic takes. So we kind of cache all the Wartovic sensates in a solar index to enable us to query that in real time. So when we did that, let me just move forward, we reduced the estimate, <coughs> the elapsed time from 400 milliseconds into 30 milliseconds. And this is definitely appropriate for the online. So, now, if I can give an answer about what type is this entity in 30 milliseconds, then this is appropriate for online. So we use the offline architecture to cache all the entity types uh, for the entities that we recognize from the search logs. But then for any entity that we've never seen before, if we need to do that in real time, then we hit the online architecture, which actually use the uh, solar caches um, to get the answer in 30 milliseconds. All right, so that was the entity type recognition. The next module in our semantic search is the ambiguous terms. What is the ambiguous term? The term ambiguity can be defined as the challenge of having multiple potential meanings for a keyword. And Java could be the coffee, could be the island, could be the programming language, right? Just as an example. Now you would say, okay, what's in your domain? Java always means the programming language, right? But how about Architect, is it the construction architect or is it the software architect? How about designer? Is it the AutoCAD designer or is it the web designer or is it the graphic designer, right? So the first thing you need to do is to detect or recognize those ambiguous terms that I have terms that have many potential meanings. How can we detect that? And then the second thing you need to do, once you detect those ambiguous terms, you need now a way to come up with the multiple meanings or different meanings that this term referred to. So again, we use our search logs and the PGMHD, but this time we use it in a different way. This time, let's, let's take a look here. Take any term here, like let's take Java, okay? If I find that Java is, has been searched equally between two or more classes from the first layer, that means it means different things. If I have on the top layer, on those, on those classes, if I have two classes and I know the distance between them is, is big, 
And I see that the same term has been searched by people from both classes, two or more, you know. Uh, enough time to say that this term is important to this class and that class, then that means it means different thing to those two different group of people, right? And here's what we, some of the interesting results that we got when we ran this model. So take an architect. We figure out that the related search terms that come from when we classify the related search terms that appear with architect, we could cluster them into two clusters, actually. One of them was enterprise architect, Java architect, data architect, Oracle, Java.net. When you look at those related terms, or this cluster of related terms, you can definitely guess that this is definitely mean the software architect. But if you look to the second related terms that we extracted, it is architectural designer, architectural drafter, AutoCAD, AutoCAD drafter, designer, drafter, CAD engineer. Then it is totally different architect now, right? So this is, this is the way we detect that the term is ambiguous or not by looking into the related terms that we grab for the term and try to cluster them. And if, if we find out that they can be clustered strongly into two or more groups, then we know actually this term means two or more things. So it is an ambiguous term. Same like look at designer, we figure out that it has three different actually meanings in our data. So why this is important? Because if, if someone now is typing architect, you should not assume that they mean software architect because you're from the software industry, right? So you should not assume that they mean software architect, so you enrich the term with all the software architect enrichment, and you hit the search engine with the entity type, okay, this is actually software architect, give me all the documents. You shouldn't assume that. So when you enrich that term, you need to make sure that you are 100% sure. If you are not 100% sure, you should ask the user, do you mean software architect or construction architect? So on the front end in the UX, the user should see the options. Do you mean software architect or uh, construction architect? Now, we're running out of time. Uh, so quickly, semantic knowledge graph is an engine that we built, again, it's a plugin on top of Apache Solar that we built mainly to score relationships between terms. So you can index any corpus into this, and if you run the semantic knowledge graph, it should be able to score the relationships between the terms in your corpus. Let's take a look about how this works. I need to know now the relationship between the skill Java and the job titles related to it. So if I give you a word as an input, I said Java, can you give me the top job titles related to Java? Okay? So the, how it works, first of all, it goes to Ansolar Index and try to find all the documents where Java is defined as a skill. This is step one. Then what it does is, for each of those documents, then it takes the document and try to find out what is the job title that was assigned to each of those documents. So in the solar index in the schema, you usually define fields. And assume there is a field skill and a field job title. So first thing, you hit the engine saying, for Java, give me all the documents that has Java. Then you take those documents and you hit the engine again saying, for each of those documents, give me the job title now. Then based on the stats that you run, you can now define a relationship or the, how strong is the relationship between Java and each of the job titles, the candidate job titles that come back from those documents. So, unfortunately, all right. So anyway, this is actually an inverted index and non-inverted index. So we index on solar, we created an inverted index and non-inverted index, and they work you know, uh, together to come up with to calculate what we call here the z-score. So, an example. Assume now I sent Hadoop, and I said, can you now give me the top related terms to Hadoop, okay? So Hadoop, we call it our foreground query. We send it to the engine. And then we run it, and we calculate the relationship between Hadoop and all the other keywords mentioned in the documents that has Hadoop. So it turned out that Hive, Spark, .NET, right? Bogus word, for example, will end up having a relatedness score of zero, zero. Teaching will end up having score, negative score, which means it's not at all related. CPR, you know. 
Now, the good news, as I said, this is open source. That's why I'm always excited about talking about it. It's open source, and my former boss at CB, he's now the senior vice president at LucidWorks, which commercialized Apache Solar. So he is working with his team at LucidWorks now to make this part of the solar distribution. So this is something you can play with. It's open source on GitHub. It just, as I said, you need to index your corpus, and then you can actually send a term and ask for the top related terms to it, send two terms and say are they related or not, send a multi term and multiple terms and ask for a score to score the relationship between them. So it is a great tool for relationship scoring. And this is a zoom in on the query augmentation engine that we built. As I said, so you sent a term machine learning. It goes through all those enrichment process that I described. And at the end, it comes back with this modified query or semantic query. It says machine learning after it goes into the intent engine is related to data mining, MATLAB, data science, artificial intelligence, neural network. And it's related to those job titles, software engineer, data manager, data scientist, Hadoop engineer. Okay. This is how it looked like in production. This is what we all care about, right? So this is a screenshot from the semantic search engine in B2B solution at Career Builder. And as you can see, it starts by taking the input from the search box, parse it using our statistical or probabilistic query parser into senior software engineer. It recognizes the entities, Perl, Hadoop, big data. And then if you click on any of those uh, terms or entities, it shows you the enrichment, semantic related things that we enrich the query with, the entity with, and you can select or deselect any of them um, upon your uh, need, okay? So this is how it looked like in production today in the B2B solution. And I'm not gonna go over the evaluation and test that we did, but at the end, I wanna show you, come on, yeah. Not before we're hiring. <laughs> before we're hiring. Yeah, so it, the keyword based search was at 59% um, NDCG when we started this work, and NDCG at uh, 10. So after we applied the semantic search, actually, we tested different strategies of semantic search. The one that one actually boosted into 76%, so there was about 16, 17% boost in the NDCG, which is extremely, extremely significant, you know. In, in, in information retrieval. And now we are hiring, so <laughs> yeah, uh, we, are expanding, we are expanding our teams, data science teams at Home Depot, so talk to me if you are interested. Thank you so much, and we have a few minutes for questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Any question? Mm -hmm. Hi, so you mentioned that you build up these basically database for semantically similar phrases. So did you test it, your approach against the word to back because that basically tried to catch the same semantic similarity? Yes, that's a good question. So uh, word to back first of all, like the, the fact that it works, it was designed mainly to work on unigrams, not bigrams and, and, and n-gram was one of the uh, challenges when we started doing this work. Second thing is yes, we actually compared the uh, semantic related terms that we extracted using the search logs analysis that we did versus what we get by word to from the content, from the uh, job postings. And the coverage that we got from the uh, search logs plus the, uh, the quality, especially on the phrases, was significantly much better than uh, the syn synonyms that you get from word to vic That's a good question. Any other question? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks for the presentation. I have two questions about the job titles. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned a little bit like Java developer as an entity, but I'm just curious, how do you parse it out? You are using like keyword search or you see the word to vac matching or the traditional NLP technique like? How to recognize that it is an entity? Yeah. Yeah. So as I said, so what we do is we, when we analyze the search logs, and we find out that 
he has two questions, so maybe, excuse me, he has two questions, so still has, has one. Yeah, so if it happened to appear enough times in the search logs as a phrase by itself, uh -huh. then this is definitely something we consider as a phrase. Uh -huh. If it's not and we want to extract it or infer that from the content, uh -huh. then the technique which I said about the probabilistic parsing, where we index the unigram, bigram, trigram, and foregrams into an index and we calculate the probability of having this term appear as unigram or bigram. This is the other way that if, if it's not in from the search logs, then using the probabilistic query parsing, we can understand that Java developer should go as a phrase. Okay, gotcha. My second question is that in terms of the job title hierarchy or mm -hmm. ontology, how do you model that? Uh, using the graph mm -hmm. or how do you model the like different yeah. like hierarchy, like software developer, Java developer? Great. So maybe that's uh, that's that wasn't anyway my that my team's focus. We have an uh, in-house team for classification, but the taxonomy in general that we use at Career Builder, it's actually uh, uh, three layers or three. Um, yeah, you can think of it as hierarchy of three layers, where we have the highest layer, and then we have a second layer, and then we have the very fine grain. So you can think of technology. Under technology, there is Java developer, .NET, blah, blah, blah. And then under Java developer, maybe there is J2EE developer, something like that. So it's three levels, taxonomy. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, how do you uh, interface that challenge? How do you personalize that challenge? That's a great question. I, I don't think at that time when we built the engine, or when I at least after like before I left the company, we were uh, utilizing that um, historical browsing and apply applications data to uh, detect if this person I should show him the software architect versus construction architect. Given that this was rolled out for the B2B solution, not for the B2C, so it's not job seekers, it's employers or recruiters. A recruiter, like recruit for all the positions, right? So we cannot personalize for recruiters. But I believe if they roll it out for the job seekers, then yes, they definitely need to consider that. Any other question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the way we valid the semantic autocomplete was by observing if the user's gonna select one of the options that we show them uh, with the category that we classify to versus keep typing and complete the query by themselves. And this is the feedback that we collect and whenever we, we notice that we show those options and the user never select them, you know, uh, or this most of the time they actually uh, try to avoid the autocomplete or disable that feature, we know that they were there is a problem with the quality. Yeah, we're talking about system performance. Uh huh. Yep. Exactly. Like it's ex exactly like we observe the performance on the after we load it out. Okay. Thank you. Curious about the uh, last question. Last question. Okay. Curious about the 400 milliseconds that the word was missing. Is there something else also going on, or is just the the raw word to like the vocabulary that you predict that the nearest next word is not there? Yeah. It's it's just the the implementation of the algorithm itself. We tried the MLlib implementation and we tried the GenSim implementation for the, for the word to Vic. And the 400 millisecond was mainly to generate the synset for, for an entity that never seen before. So it was basically the, the algorithm itself or the implementation itself. Yep. Thank you, Khalifa. Thank you, appreciate it.